Let your glory and your power, let your majesty 
David wrote this in the book of Psalms, chapter 139, 14 through 15. It says, I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. 
wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth.
Today, uh, we're going to cover quite a bit, and before we cover anything, I want to say real quick thank you uh, to the leadership here at Grace City Church um, for all the elders that work here and that, and that help lead us, and so um, that's Grady Odell, uh, Elder Mark Dace, um, as well as Elder Chris Parks, who prayed with me before I got to preach. I want to thank you guys for trusting a 23-year-old man to come up and deliver God's word uh, on a platform in front of hopefully 500 people today between this and, and second service. And so that's a huge deal. Uh, we don't take that lightly. I don't take that lightly. My family does not take that lightly. So I want to say thank you. And I also want to say, uh, he's not here like, like Sean said earlier, but I want to say thank you to Pastor Kenny as well um, for allowing me the opportunity to come up here and to speak. Because I don't know if you guys ever talked to many 20-year-olds. Uh, if you were to give them a platform to preach in front of 500 people, that would be a big gamble. Right, And so I want to say thank you to him and his leadership, uh, him and his wife. And like, like Sean said earlier, the, I think it was the coolest thing that last week, it was right after second service, and Kenny came to me and said, hey, I need you. He actually forgot to tell me, and he randomly told me as we were walking out the door Sunday morning, he said, hey, I need you to preach Sunday. And I was like, well, I'm okay, that's okay, that's the last minute, but I can do that. And he said, well, because um, my wife's grandfather is being baptized. And like Sean said, that's such a huge deal, 87-year-old man being baptized. And one thing I want to talk about real quick, um, not about the sermon at all, just about that one idea. I want to encourage you guys, if you have a friend or you have a family member or a kid or parents, um, sometimes as you pour into someone's life, you may not see the fruit until 45 years later. And some of you guys, like you have a kid who's struggling or you have a friend who's struggling or you have a neighbor you've been trying to pour into and you're like, well, God's just not working and God's just not moving. This man is 87 years old, almost 90 years old, which is almost 100, which is about... 90 years-ish more than me. I don't know math that well, but it's just huge. But just imagine for a moment, right, the faithfulness of people in his life and who God has brought into his life to share the gospel with him, the churches he would walk into, that the pastors would try to pour into him, and he would say, no, I'm not having it. And everyone probably felt like, well, this is null and void. He's never going to be saved. You might as well just give him and throw him the towel. But I believe there was a few faithful people in his life that continued to be an encouragement, continued to be an example. Now this man's almost 90 years old getting baptized. I'm going to encourage you guys this morning. Some of you guys have that friend, you got that family member, and they're just struggling, and you're like, well, I tried for five years. Listen, guys, sometimes you're called to, you're called to water, sometimes you're called to plant, and sometimes, or every time God gives a growth. And maybe we're not there to see it, but our job is only to remain faithful. Amen? Amen. Amen. You guys excited this morning? Awesome. So, guys, here's what we're going to do. We're going to cover quite a bit of passages this morning. Um, just so you guys know, if you, if you leave here and you're like, what's the fall? And that sermon was very unrefined. I was up here Friday night um, preparing my message, really excited. I, I had I had Stephen, um, who's in charge of our lights and sound and all of our visual productions. He's in charge of doing everything. I, I had him make about 50 slides for Sunday morning with, like, eight points and, like, three sub points. I was super excited, ready to go. And I was up here and I was sharing the gospel to empty seats because I was practicing, right? And and right around 10.30 Friday night, I was like, man, this is just is not right. And so I scrapped the entire sermon and called Stephen at 11.30 at night and said, hey, I'm going to give you 85 more slides to write up, and I need you to do that, and you're going to be awesome, and thanks a lot. And so he did that between um, Saturday and today. I don't know where he had the time for that, but he gets here at 2 a.m. Sunday morning. So there's probably from 2 a.m. to today. So I want you guys to know uh, today is not as practiced as I would like, but I believe God has a powerful word, and sometimes God works through preparation, and sometimes God's works through spontaneity. Amen. Awesome. So this morning we're going to be uh, in quite a bit of different passages. We're going to be in, in 2 Kings. So if you have your Bible, I encourage you, go to, I encourage you to go to 2 Kings chapter 2. If you don't have your Bible, you can download our, our Grace City Church app. Uh, you can go to Grace City Mo. You can download that. And uh, you can have our, an, our app. And it has a Bible on there from the ES, uh, English Standard Version. I encourage you to do that as well. There are some Bibles in the back uh, by some green chairs. You guys can pick those up as well so you guys can read along. Because we believe in Grace City Church that if you do not know how to navigate, the word of God, you will be susceptible to enemy attack, and you will not know how to defend if you don't know how to use your word. You don't know how to use your sword, right? If you're not sharpening your sword and Satan comes into your house and you don't have the right tools to fight him off, that's not on me as a pastor. That's on you from opening your Bible and knowing where to go. Amen? Okay, so we're going to be in 2 Kings chapter 2, and I'm going to give you guys some background story real quick. We're going to have three main characters. Everyone say three. Three main characters. I also want to encourage you guys, remind you that I'm a hollow back preacher. Okay, so if I say something that you love and, and you, you, you felt encouraged, you would say, Amen. Amen. If I say something, you're like, man, that was really harsh, you would probably say, 
Yeah, right. And if you're like that guy who has that inner Negro and you're really excited and I say something, you're like, preach it, brother. Okay, that's okay, right? We want to make sure that you guys are communicating and talking. We want to have a conversation and not just me yelling at you for 30 minutes, okay? And so you guys know, should you use that word on stage? I'm debatable. I don't know. Email Kenny Todd, Kenny Todd 73 at gmail.com. Email him and he will tell you if that's good or bad, okay? But anyways, we're going to cover three main characters today. We have Yahweh. Everyone say Yahweh. Yahweh is like the leader. He's the main character of every story, of our story, of the 87-year-old being baptized this morning. He is, he is the leader and the main character of every single story, and we're excited about that this morning. Amen? Yeah. Like we experience Yahweh's presence as we walk through these doors, and we just shout out for 20 minutes who God is through song. And I don't know if you guys prepared your hearts this morning, but I told my men's Bible study yesterday morning, the best way to prepare your hearts before church Sunday morning is you go home before you even get here, and you fall on your face and worship. It's hard to be proud in front of Yahweh, the main character of our story, of our lives, if you get on your face before him. So before, before church, or before the sermon, the last song, I went in the prayer room, and I got on my face and just worshiped. I said, God, I want you to speak. I don't care what I have planned or not planned, right? I want you to speak through me because I have a fear of you more than I have a fear of man. Amen? And so, guys, I want to encourage you guys. That's our main character is Yahweh, right? Yahweh is, is the leader. He is, he's the guy who has adopted us, who has called us, who has who is, um, chosen us to be here this morning. And we are excited about him. Then we have a guy named Elijah. Everyone say Elijah. Elijah. Now, Elijah is a stud. I mean, he is like the Old Testament stud outside of Moses because he's my favorite character in the Bible except for Yahweh, right? But uh, Elijah is this guy who is doing crazy things, like raising the dead. He performs 14 amazing miracles in the Old Testament. I mean, this guy is like the Old Testament, like, Jedi. He's like Qui-Gon Jinn, right, for all your history buffs, and he is a leader. I mean, everyone wants to listen to him. He's awesome. He's great. He calls out authorities. I mean, this guy is like the Old Testament Ned Stark, you know what I'm saying? And if you get that joke, then we're going to pray for you later for watching that. But anyways, um, so we, this, is, this guy is awesome. He is the leader, and we are excited about this man. And then we have another guy named Elisha. Everyone say Elisha. Elisha. Yeah, that's an S and H, not a J. It's kind of confusing, right? So if you want to disciple somebody, find someone with the same name as you with one letter difference, and then that'll, it'll be effective, right? And so he finds his main name, Elisha. So we have, we have Yahweh up here, and then we have Elijah, and then we have Elisha. And so what happens is uh, Yahweh speaks to Elijah, who's a prophet of the Old Testament, who is a mouthpiece of God, and God uses him to call out kings, to encourage people, to lead people, right, to do miracles in his name, and we love that. And then we have Elisha, who simply learns from Elijah as Elijah learns from Yahweh, right? So there's it's, it's like this tier, and so it's, we're going to talk about that for a moment. We're going to talk about today our main text is actually going to be in St. Kings chapter 7. We're going to be there in a little bit, but, but before we do that, I want to give you guys a background story of what happens between Elijah and Elisha. And so the passage we're about to read today, we are coming into it knowing that Elijah, everyone say Elijah. Elijah. We're, we're going to come into this text today knowing Elijah is about to die. Not only that, but Elisha knows Elijah is about to die. And not only Elijah and Elisha both know Elijah is about to die, but the entire country knows Elijah is about to be taken away. So we're going to read the story of what happens. Right? Elijah is about to be taken away, going up to heaven. One of two men that's not ever tasted the sting of death, Elijah, 2 Kings chapter 2. I'm going to start in verse 1. 2 Kings chapter 2, starting in verse 1. I'm going to read from the Amplified Version. And for those of you guys who don't know, the Amplified just gives uh, some explaining details of some words in the Old Testament and the New Testament, just so you guys are aware of that. 2 Kings chapter 2, we're going to be in verse 1. 2 Kings chapter 2, we're going to be in verse 1. When the, when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were traveling from Gilgal, um, from Gilgal, right? And, and Elijah said to Elisha, please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elisha replied, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. And so they went down to Bethel, and now the sons of the prophets who were at Bethel came out to Elisha and said, do you know that the Lord will take your master away from you today? So just imagine that for a moment. We're going to pause real quick. Imagine that. You know your leader is about to die, right? And you're sitting here in a town, and you have some little guys that barely know your leader saying, hey, just so you know, he's going to die. All right? Can you imagine the frustrating that would be? Like, imagine, like, if you're, if you're married, right, and let's say you're, you're a wife and you respect and love your husband, which is hopefully every woman in here, um, but may not be. I don't know. I don't know who you or your story, but, and so imagine, like, I'm going to you. I barely know your husband's name. Hey, by the way, do you know your husband's going to die today? Yes, I know. Thank you, right? We all know it. It's on the countryside. It's on banners. We get it, right? So he says, hey, they're about to die. And so he says, yes, I know about it and be quiet about it. He said, I know. 
Please shut up, right? And he said to him, Elisha, Elijah said to him then, please stay here if the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho, and the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho approached Elisha and said to him, again, it's two times now, do you know that the Lord would take your master away from you today? And he said, yes, I know, and be quiet about it. Like, like for me, like, I can see the situation, and I would be so mad, right? Like, imagine the guy that pours into you. Maybe it's your, your favorite coach. Maybe it's your favorite teacher, right? Maybe it's uh, your pastor, Kenny, hopefully, right? Maybe it's somebody in your life that's poured into you, a favorite uncle, right? That one uncle that always does those things that are kind of questionable, and they make everybody laugh, and you love when he pours into you. And maybe, it's your, maybe it's a father. Maybe it's a mother. Maybe it's a youth pastor, whoever it is, someone that pours into you, and you're going to a town that people barely know. And they're like, just so you know, your leader is going to die. I would be just like Elisha. like, yo. I know, shut up about it, right? I get it, I know he's gonna die, it's frustrating, it's hurtful, so just imagine for a moment, right? Imagine the, the pain that Elisha's in, knowing that the man who he's been following is about to die. And then all of the weight of being the, the Israelite prophet is gonna be weighed on his shoulders. So he knows it. And Elijah said to him, please stay here if the Lord has sent me to Jordan. But he says, the Lord lives, check this out, as the Lord lives, I will not leave you. So several times, Elisha tells Elijah, everyone, says, everyone say Elisha real quick. Everyone says, so, so we know like Elisha tells Elijah several times, I will not leave you. Now this is, this is amazing. This is awesome. I love this part because this is the, this is the Matthew or the um, Matthew principle spelled out in the Old Testament. Matthew 28 says, go and make disciples of all nations. And this man who's like, hey, I'm going to go and travel. I'm doing my last day alive. i got to hit three different cities up, so we're going to be traveling a lot, doing a lot, and I want you to stay here. And every time he's like, I'm not going to stay here. I want to go with you because you're my leader, you're my teacher, and I still want to learn from you. This is what discipleship looks like. Now we're talking about discipleship, right? So this is what discipleship looks like. And disciple, all that means to be a disciple is to be a student or a learner of the word. And so Elisha is being led by Elijah to such a severity that no matter what, Elisha wants to follow him wherever he goes. This is huge. And I love this principle because I love looking at Grace City Church and how, because, you know, we know that teachers teach, amen, and leaders lead, amen. And so we know that it's hard for someone on stage to tell you, hey, you should disciple someone, you should be pouring into somebody if we are not doing that ourselves, right? Uh, that'd be hard. For example, I feel like a hypocrite every Sunday morning. Whenever I tell you guys during announcements, do not leave your communion cups wherever you want to. Because every Sunday morning, I take the communion and I drop the cup wherever I'm at. And I just keep on walking every Sunday morning. Right? And that's hypocritical. So if you see me doing that, call me out, smack my hand, pick it up, tell me to throw it away. Right? But, so, so cool. Old Testament, right? Discipleship played out. Elijah and Elisha. I love this because I, I look at Great City Church. And I, and I know two, about two and a half years ago, you guys just met Sean. He was on stage, and we introduced him a couple weeks ago as well. But he left two and a half years ago, him and his family, to go to Detroit. And they were going to Detroit because God called them there for a season. And I can imagine like people were like, well, this is not good, and what are we going to do? And, and Sean Adams just said simply, it's okay. I, I know a guy. Now I know I know a guy. I raised a guy. I ra- and don't, get, don't, don't cry because crying is weird. You know, don't, that's, don't do that. Um, but and he's like, I, I know a guy. I raised a guy. And so I know he can help lead youth ministry because I've trained him. The past four years. So it's cool. Hire Stefan and let him go do what I've already taught him to do. Go ahead and let him, let him do what I've already led him to. Like, I've already taught him, led him, taught him, and all these things, right? We, so what discipleship is is you pour in someone, you raise them up, and then you send them out, right? So hopefully, parents, what you're doing with your kids is you're pouring into your kids with the knowledge of the gospel, and you're raising them up in the word of God, and you're sending them out to impact every area of life. Amen? Amen. Right? Hopefully, that's your goal. But it's so cool because Sean said, I know a guy because I've raised him, so I'm going to pour into him, raise him, and I'm sending him out. I love it. Discipleship. I love even looking at the same thing with this coming year, right? We have youth groups starting this Sunday night here, starting at 6 for middle schoolers to 7.30 and 7.30 to 8.30 for uh, high schoolers. And I love that because I'm not the one leading that. I'm going to be present. I'm going to be a part of it. But Matt DeLeo is leading that. And I love that. Do you know why? Because a year ago, on, January, or on, on uh, July 23rd, 2017, the day Matt was baptized, I told him, hey, I'm going to train you up. I'm going to stop you for ministry. And I believe within five years, you're going to be leading ministry. Now here he is, one year later, about to lead ministry. How great is that? Amen? Amen. Yeah, give God a hand. And, and, and I, love, I love this reality, right, that our goal as believers is to pour into people and to raise them up and to send them out. Amen? Yeah. Everyone say discipleship. Now, now let, me just, let me just say this real quick. I know sometimes I can say things that, that are slightly um, uh, abrasive and aggressive, and I know that. My wife tells me to stop doing that, but I'm a, I'm a slow learner. If you guys don't know me, you know that about me. I'm a slow learner, right? And so one thing I think is huge for us as believers, if we are not as believers, everyone say, I'm a believer. 
So if you say that, then if you are not actively pouring in, raising up, and sending people out to the world to affect the lives of people around you, we are not fulfilling the great commission of God. Our goal as believers is not simply to go to Sunday morning church. Like Sean said earlier, go through the simple routines of life. Go through, well, yeah, I'm going to raise my hands because it's four songs. Even though I'm not happy, even though I'm angry, even though I don't even like God, I don't even know if I believe in God, I'm going to raise my hands because every uber spiritual person raises their hands. So I'm going to do that too. And then I'm going to give an offering because, you know, like my, my girlfriend says to do it. And so I do it. And then I take communion just because everyone else is doing it. I don't want to be the, the odd man out. And you just simply go through all these motions, right? And if you are not, if you're a believer, you are not pulling into people, raising them up and sending them out. We are not fulfilling the Great Commission. It's not just going through the motions. And it's saying if you're a parent, right, this is huge for parents. If, if you're a parent in here, you already have people you're discipling. You have a captive audience for 17 years. That's awesome. That's why. Well, Stefan, why do you have a kid? I'll tell you why. I want to have a captive audience, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to raise this spiritual guru, right, in the next 17 and a half years. It's going to be awesome. You may be super smart. I know. We put her in Bible class at age three. You know what I'm saying? Like discipleship to a max. And, and it's the idea that you should be pouring up, raising up, and sending out people, right? If you're, if you're a young person in the room, right? If you're, if you're younger, it is your job, just so you guys know, right? It is huge and imperative that you would find somebody older than you, and you would sit under their leadership and allow them to teach you, right? I know one of the biggest issues of my generation, the generation beneath me, is that we believe, we have the audacious claim that because I'm 23 or because I'm 13, I have all the answers to the universe. And just so you guys know, for a young person, I'm one of you guys, just so you guys know, you are not that smart, you don't have it all figured out, myself included, right? And we need to learn from our parents and learn from our grandparents. Just imagine, right? So, so Liz's um, f- uh, grand- grandfather is being baptized. So he's 87 years old, and you're 13. Imagine how much more life experience he's went through than you. And so I always want to fall on your face. Why don't you just learn from his mistakes and learn from his, learn from his past, and then just learn from that guy and just go about your day. And learn from your people. Right? If you're older in the church, you're an older believer, and you're not discipling somebody, I'm going to let you know that you are letting the gospel down. It's your job to disciple somebody. Try to pour into, raise up, and send out. It's your job. Why? Because the entire community is affected by that. Right? Amen? As we see this, we see this all played out in Elijah and Elisha. I love this. And so we're going to keep on reading. So the two, so two of them went on, and 50 men of the sons of the prophets also went and stood opposite them to watch at a distance. And the two of them stood by at Jordan, and Elijah took his mantle coat, rolled it up, and struck the waters. And there they were divided this way and that. So the two of them crossed over on dry ground. So he literally split the Jordan River, right? This is awesome. And when they had crossed over, Elijah, Elijah said to Elisha, ask, what shall I do before I am taken from you? And Elijah said, well, okay, if you're going to ask me, before you die, the man of God, you're going to ask me what I want before you die. I'll tell you, I want a double portion of what you have. Yeah. That's huge, right? So he was like, if you're, if you're going to be taken up and I'm going to be left to take on your mantle, I want you to give me a double portion of your power. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Now, if you guys are leading, if you guys are pouring in, raising up and sending out, it's your job to say that I am raising somebody who is even better than I am at ministry. I know I lead a high school and college age Bible study, and one day uh, Matt DeLeo led Bible study, and one of my, after Bible study, one of my buddies came up, and he was very upset. And he said, just so you guys know, when Matt started talking, I was mad. He said, I was mad because, Stefan, I came to hear you talk, and I almost left. But he said, then after the Bible study, I realized that Matt's a better teacher, so why are you even here? <laughs> that happened, yeah. I was like, that's a compliment, I think. I don't know, right? Good job being a disciple, learn how to be a better teacher, right? But it was awesome, right? Because the end goal is not that you would raise somebody beneath you or underneath you. You would raise someone that would be better than you in all the ways that you live your life. Parents, grandparents, it's your job, right? Kids, it's your job to learn from these people. He said, I want a double portion of your inheritance. I'm like, amen, hallelujah. This is why if you look at me, right, and you say, well, Stefan, you're a great talker, right, and you're a great communicator, and you're great at loving people, well, thanks Sean Adams, right, because he, he taught me. I just simply followed his footsteps. He loves people, so I just love people. Now, if you tell me anything negative about myself, it's power from Sean as well, right? And so you can blame Sean for that, right? Well, you're just overly whatever. It's like, yeah, just blame Sean. You know, I learned that from him. And so just always deflect, right? Deflect that back to somebody else, right? So I blame my leaders, right? And so there's that. Um, my, my generation also is not taking responsibility, right? And so, and so he says, give me a dull portion of your spirit um, that be upon me. So he said, you have asked for a difficult thing. However, if you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall not be so. And as they continued along and talked, behold, a chariot, watch it, a chariot of fire with horses of fire appeared suddenly and separated the two of them. 
And Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. And Elijah saw it and cried out, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and its horsemen. He no longer saw Elijah. And they took hold of his own clothes and took, and took them and tore two pieces in grief because he tore them apart. He was upset. And he picked up the mantle of Elijah that fell off him and went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and struck the waters. And where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And when he, when he, when he, when he, and when he too struck the waters, they divided this way and that, and Elisha crossed the, crossed the river. This is awesome. So guys, this, this, this is huge, right? So, so he says, I want, if you're going to leave me, I want a double portion of your power. And then he gets taken up into heaven. This is amazing, right? Imagine, like, horses of fire, something straight out of the Chronicles of Narnia, right? And so, and, and he's taken up into heaven. And so he gets the clothes of Eli, Elijah, and he hits the water, and then he splits the Jordan River. He says, I want a double portion of your inheritance. Elijah, it's really cool. Elijah performed four, 14 miracles in the Old Testament. Do you know how many Elisha did? 28. Yeah, he did literally double the miracles, which is huge, right? It's, like, it's almost like God planned it out like that. It's crazy, right? Like almost like God ordained the word of God to be there, which is like baffling to me, right? You know, our, our goal as believers is to pour in people, raise them up, and send them out, right? This is huge. Right? If, you're, if, you're, if you're a parent, I want to say thank you. Right? If you're a faithful parent, I want to say thank you. If you're, if you're a mother and a father, I want to encourage you guys this morning. Just like um, Liz's 87-year-old grandfather, if you're a father, I want to encourage you. Your leadership is changing lives. And just remain steadfast, remain patient. Mothers, your love, your nurturing spirit is changing lives. Just remain patient. I'm sorry for the roads you have ahead sometimes. I'm sorry because my generation, the younger generation, we are terrible at listening. And I apologize for that on behalf of all of us, 20-year-olds and below. But we are listening and we are following in your footsteps. You ever, heard, you ever heard a kid say, like, I don't listen to anything about my parents, and they're raised up, and they're just like their parents? <laughs> Happens all the time. I'm telling you what, there's so many things that my mom does that drives me insane. I'm not kidding. She, she can talk sometimes, and I immediately get, I'm like, oh, my, oh my gosh, mom, please stop. And, and I find myself so many times doing exactly the things that drives me insane about my mom. Why? Because I'm learning from her. So I encourage you guys, just remain steadfast. Remain in a prayerful state. Discipleship is not all about, like, knowing the entire Bible. It's not all about you got to memorize um, Genesis through Revelation, which is all the 66 books of the Bible. Discipleship is relationships. Discipleship is the ability to sit down with somebody on a weekly or semi-regular basis and just love on them. Right? Teddy Roosevelt says this quote, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And so spending time showing someone that you care about them and then raising them to teach them what you know. This is awesome. And now, so if you guys in this room, you guys are sitting there and you're like, well, I'm not a pastor and I'm not discipling somebody. I don't know how to disciple somebody because I have some crap in my own life. And I get that, right? I get that we all go through seasons. We are either walking into a storm, we're in a storm, or we just walked out of a storm. And we get that. We totally understand you. But I want to encourage you real quick from a second Bible story from St. Kings chapter 6. I want to encourage you that God cares about every single small part of your life. Amen? Has anybody, can we just be honest for a moment? Can you raise your hand? This is a very honest thing. Can you raise your hand if you ever felt like God did not care about you in some way? This is huge. I know I have. Like, I know my dad left when I was three years old because he was addicted to drugs and cheated on my mom. And I felt for the longest time that my, that my God, this God that you guys believed in at the time, there's no way he could love me. And I had some issues in my heart I had to work out. So I'm going to convince you guys from St. Kings chapter 6, starting in verse 1, I'm going to convince you that God cares about every area of your life. So go with, with, you, with me real quick. 2 Kings Chapter 6, starting in verse 1. This is all encouragement. I know that the very first, you know, 28 minutes is all about you guys need to disciple someone. If you're not doing that, you should be ashamed, right? The, the, the next few minutes is all about, I'm just going to encourage you guys real quick. Is that okay? Can I encourage you guys for a moment? Sure. 2 Kings chapter 6, chapter, chapter six, starting in verse 1. Again, Elijah is now dead. Elisha is left alone. Now the sons of the prophets said to Elisha, look now, the place where we live near you is too small for us. And please let us go to the Jordan River and let each man take from them a beam for the building and let us make a place there for ourselves that we may live. Now, this is, like a, this is a kind of a weird story to show you guys. No, it's kind of weird. So the very beginning, these sons of the prophets, these sons who are now following Elisha, they're like, hey, listen, we're all living in the same house. It's like, it's like this really bad fraternity, right? And this house is way too small. How can we fix it? And so like, let's just go and build a new house. And so what's happening is they're all going because man, mainly men build houses. Amen. Yeah, you have blisters, right? So if you're a carpenter, you are a man. If you're not, and you're like me, well, we'll work on that later, right? Um, and he answered, he, he, said, he said, well, then go. And so we said, be willing to go with your servants. So we answered, I shall go. I will go with you guys to help you build this house. And so we went with them. And when they came to the Jordan, they cut down some of the trees. But it happened that as one was cutting down a beam, the axe head, watch this, the cutting down a tree and the axe head 
fell into the water, and he cried out, oh, no, my master, it was borrowed. This is crazy. Like, you know, have you ever, you ever thought about if you were in the Bible, where you would be at in the Bible? You know, for some people, like, well, I'd be one of the apostles. Or, well, I'd be Jesus' right-hand man. Or, I'd be Peter, James, and John. I'd be Moses. This would be me. Like, if I was in the Bible in any regard, this would be me, right? We're out there doing manly work, which you should have hired someone else to do, not brought me along, but you're doing manly work, and I'm in the, over there like, trying to cut a tree down, and the ax head flows into the water, and I'd be like, oh, no, Kenny, I borrowed this ax. Fix it. Like, I would be freaking out, right? So if there was anybody in the Bible, that would be me. If you had had a question, this would be me. No name, just one situation, one sentence. Oh, no, master. This ax that I borrowed got broken. Fix it now. If you guys know me at all, you know how real that story really is. I would be like, God, I need you to fix it. Like, Kenny, this is your problem. Now you fix it. If you, and if you don't find it, I guarantee I'll put all the blame on you. Well, where's my ax at? Sorry, guys. Kenny, you know, he didn't, I couldn't find it, you know, so that's. It's not on me. It's on him, right? This, this will be me, right? And so he's like, oh, no, master, like, it, it fell into the water. And so, and so he says, the man of God, which is Elisha, says, where did it fall? And he showed him to this place, and Elisha cut off a stick, which is cool, and threw it into the water, and made the iron axe had flow. And he said, pick it up for yourself. So he reached out with his own hand and took it. Now, this is crazy, right? So, again, this, this man is kind of interesting, right? Uh, I, almost, I almost called the, uh, sermon, the sermon this morning, Stupid Axe. But I didn't want to do that because um, I thought it would sound very, um, yeah, so I didn't do that. But if I, had, if I had to label this part of it, I would label it stupid axe, right? And so you're sitting there, you're cutting a tree down, your axe head flies into the water, and you're freaking out. And you're like, okay, God, the, the man of God, you have power, and God's going to do things in your life. Elisha raised the dead. He does all these different things. He commands nature at some point. He does some amazing stuff for the word of God, amen? And one of the miracles he does is he simply throws a stick into the water and make an axe head float to the top. And reading this, I get confused. I'm like, well, why would you care about an accent? Like, it's, it's an accent. Like, at the end of the day, it's not that big of a deal. At the end of the day, you'll just get yelled at by whoever you borrowed it from, right? Amen? Right? But it's crazy because what happens is God says, you know what? I know this is important to you. I know this matters to you. So I will use all of my power to make it come forth. And I just want to encourage you guys this morning that some of you guys have situations, you guys have struggles and, and temptations and sins, and you guys are hurting, you guys are struggling. And I want you guys to know that God cares about it, literally every single part of your life. Now, this is huge. It's an, it's an accent. At the end of the day, the worst case scenario, all that would happen is this man would have to go to whoever he borrowed from and say, hey, can you please forgive me? I'll pay you back, whatever. But God is not a God that only cares about the big things. He's our God that cares about every single thing tiny, finite things about our lives. Amen? And you're like, well, God just doesn't care. I don't, I don't, I don't see him. I don't, I don't feel him move. I want to encourage you guys. I mean, just talk to God. If you're that person struggling, just talk to him. It's okay to go home, right? You get in a fight with your spouse or whatever on the way back from church because sometimes Satan wants to attack you during church, on the way to church, or after church. That way you can limit God's power while you're in this room, right? So imagine you get into an argument, right, and you go home, and you say, God, I just want to be honest with you. I am frustrated as heck. So you guys know God already knows your thoughts. He knows your hurts. He knows your pains. Nothing you say will surprise him. God, I am ticked off today. I want you to know, God, I am so mad. I don't know why you forsook me. I don't know why you let me down. I don't know where you were at when my dad left. I don't know what you're doing with my sister. I don't know where you're at in all these situations. And I'm so mad and I'm so frustrated because God already knows your hurt. He already knows your heart. So okay to be honest, right? He says, God, I want you to fix all these things. I love when Christ is on the cross and he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The craziest part is he just quoted David in the book of Psalms. He quoted him because David was in a bad, life, bad time in his life. And he just said, God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is all discipleship is, going back to the main theme. This is discipleship. It's the ability to be honest with individuals who you're leading and be honest with God who's leading you. Right? It, the goal at Grace City Church is never that we would come across, that we are perfect and we have it all together. If you ever listen to me, Sean, or Kenny talk, even just, even just Sean shared a little bit about his hurt this morning. We're real people with real struggles, with real hurts, with real pains. And we just communicate that openly with people. Right, you know what I'm struggling with? You just ask me, I'll tell you. There's no secrets here. You know what I'm saying? But I'm gonna encourage you guys, man. God loves you so much. He loves every single part of you. He knows you by name. You know how intimate it is to know someone's name? He knows you by name. He's called you by name. He's gonna deliver you by name. He's gonna walk with you by name. Because he cares seriously about every single detail of your life, including your kids and their struggles, 
including your marital struggles, including your car problems, including your electricity bill. He cares about literally every single part of your life. And our only goal is to trust him and ask for his help, even if it's as small as a stupid ax falling into the Jordan River. And Gracie Church, I don't want you guys to leave here no, well, I'm just mad because I'm a sibling. Somebody feels like someone call me out. I just want to encourage you guys that God loves you. But he did not love you just to stop with you. He loved you so you can go love others. Like he loved you so you can tell others about the love that he has given you. Right? Amen. I'll tell you guys the last thing I'm going to say real quick and I'm going to pray. Then you guys can all leave. The, the, the way that I became saved, like the, the day that I became saved, we were on a mission trip in, East, in, uh, in uh, St. Louis with Sean Adams, and he was leading me in that. I was a sophomore in high school, didn't want to go. I hated it. He said, someone bought your ticket. And it's just like, crap, well, I got to go now. So I worked it off in the summertime, um, and then we got to the St. Louis, and he kept saying, I love you. And it really just kind of, like, ticked me off, and be honest, right? I would say pissed, but you can't say that from the stage. Um, and, I, and it really just ticked me off. And, and finally, one night after worship, he's like, hey, I love you. And I got so mad. And I pulled him aside, and I was like, you cannot love me because my own dad didn't love me. And then he shared the gospel with me. And then I got saved that day, and that next morning, I felt called to ministry. That was probably six years ago now, seven years ago. And all he did was say, hey, I love you. He said, God loves me and cares about every single part of my life, so I'm going to let you know that I love you and care about every single part of your life. There was no magic code. It wasn't because he quoted all of the book of Romans, right? It was he just showed simple love. And I just encourage you guys this morning that God loves you so much, and your encouragement this morning is to go out and to show simple love to people. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, Lord, we thank you. God, we praise you for all of your power. We praise you for all of your goodness. We praise you for being holy and independent and, and indescribable. God, you are a just king. You are kind. You are the Lord of lords. Lord, you are merciful. You are nearby. You are omniscient, omnipresent, omnitemporal. God, you are a prince. Lord, you are on a quest for righteousness. You are our redeemer. You are our sanctified savior. Lord, you are tenacious. Lord, you, you are understanding in our struggles. You are victorious in our pains. Lord, you are the way, the truth, and the life, and no one goes to the Father except through you, Jesus. Lord, you are not xenophobic. Lord, you do not judge us based upon where we come from, what side of the tracks we are, we're from, or how much money we have in bank account. You are Yahweh. You are the great I am. And you are all things that we are not, and you are zealous for people who love you. You are the alpha. You are the beginning. You are the creative creator. Lord, you are directly affecting faithfulness in our lives. You produce fruits. God, I just pray this morning that we can focus in on who you are. And God, I pray that discipleship looks like people in Grace City Church doing a simple love for people around them. Sometimes, Lord, the, the, the greatest moments, the greatest miracles come from the small situations. Like an accident being found in the Jordan River. Or loving someone and just letting them know that, that, that they're cared about. You got to pray an encouragement of all the parents in this room. I pray that no matter where, what season of life their kids are in, I pray you give them encouragement, Lord. No matter what struggles, I pray you give them faithfulness and steadfastness and endurance to see their kids come to the other side. God, I pray for the kids in this room, Lord. I pray for every person who's still living at home. And I pray you give us the, the ability and the humility to follow our parents, to follow our pastors, to follow people who are older than us in the faith so we can learn from their mistakes, we can learn from their victories, and we can learn how to be disciples of Jesus Christ and the people around us. And Lord, lastly, I just want to encourage everybody in this room, Lord, I just pray that you wrap your arms around every single person here and you remind them that you care about every single and small detail of their life. Jesus Christ, we love you. And we praise you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Grace to church. We love you guys. See you guys all next week.